Houston, Texas, 1986. His ad in the personals column read, single male looking for the right woman. This clever con man picked his victims' purses after winning their hearts. Los Angeles, 1991. After the riot destroyed large parts of this neighborhood, con artists descended like vultures upon people looking to rebuild their homes. A look at why so many wound up homeless and in hock. New York City, 1983. He said he was the son of a movie star and the doors of New York's elite opened wide. Meet David Hampton, the con man who inspired a hit Broadway play. Crooked Casanovas, disaster frauds, affinity cons. Could you be the next victim? We'll enter the world of schemes, scams, and flim flams, and Professor Arthur Miller of the Harvard Law School discusses new ways to prevent these bunco cases when we open the Justice Files. to meet a rogues gallery of master conmen and legendary swindlers. Although their scams may vary, they each have a few things in common. Intelligence, nerves of steel, and a lack of moral integrity. Our first profile from 1993 introduces you to a man who took on dozens of different identities, but was known to the police as Limo Tommy. His full name is Thomas Darnell Williams, and he's now serving a 15-year sentence in a Florida prison. Well, let me put it this way, on a scale of 1 to 10, he was about a 12. And he's very good, and he knows it, and he keeps wanting to push it to the limit and beyond. I just couldn't imagine that somebody would, A, have enough nerve to try and do what he did, and B, have enough ability and talent to get away with it. You figure the people you ripped off are just stupid? Stupid? Slow. Just slow. A little bit slower than I am. He stole, cheated, and swindled his way through South Florida with only one goal, taking free rides in the backs of limousines. You don't find many limousines in the ghettos of South Miami where Tommy grew up. His parents walked away from him. He was raised by an aunt. And after junior high, he dropped out of school. Then, on the way to a party, an obsession was born. And you got in that car for the first time and said, I want this car. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have enough money to buy it, so I thought of a way of uh, just uh, making it my personal car, so to speak. Got away with it. Got away with it. We were contacted by what we assumed at the time was a limousine company in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, they claimed that they were overbooked for a Friday night. They had guest for a very good customer of theirs, a Judge uh, Wright. The guy tells you he's the head of a limousine service. That's correct. It's actually Tommy Williams. Right. How do I fool you? Easy. I tell you we'll charge it by phone order. The client won't be uh, having the card or it's a regular client. Don't worry, it's fine. Well, he sounded like he owned the limousine company. He knew all the ins and outs of limousine companies. You know, I asked the right questions. He had the right answers. So, Hoff showed up at the Shawnee Hotel in Miami Beach to pick up Judge Wright's cousin. Tommy himself came out. Right. Introduced himself as the cousin to the judge who was hired to car for the evening. Didn't you ever think of going to the phone book or something to check to see if this is a real thing? There company? is a star limousine in the phone book. Indeed there was. Placed there by Tommy Williams for just such an occasion. Oh, yeah. It was my own telephone number. <laughs> and what about Judge Wright? Well, there is a Judge Wright in Fort Lauderdale, an hour north of Miami, who started receiving a whole bunch of mysterious bills. I like a nice party, but I didn't have any limousines to get to. <laughs> no, sir. It wasn't my lifestyle. Before long, Tommy Williams had become a one-man crime wave. Hotels and limo companies were reporting dozens of similar crimes. The police began looking for Tommy. I like the guy. I mean, I like him as a person, not for what he did or what he stood for. Paul Hernandez of the Metro-Dade Economic Crimes Bureau went undercover as a limousine driver to catch Tommy. We came in, we moved in, and we arrested Tommy and company. Suddenly, Tommy Williams' backseat joyrides came to a screeching halt. After four months in prison, Tommy was out again. And in the neighborhoods of South Miami, the legend of Limo Tommy began to take shape. Now you told me you owned the limousine company. 
We just threw parties for me, and we ride, went riding around in the limousines. He would call delicatessens, and he would call restaurants, and invite his friends to have a block party. And then he would have them ride around in his limousine, and take them where they wanted to go, and basically be Robin Hood. A phone call came around lunchtime, I think one of the girls answered and said, Don't ask Eddie Gendry if Tommy is Robin Hood. He owns a delicatessen in North Miami. One day, the phone rang and a distinguished sounding caller ordered $1,500 worth of food for a supposed graduation party. And who's throwing the party? Judge Wright. Uh, he went for it, and uh, that was that. And we discussed payment at COD upon delivery. No problem. If anyone calls you with a credit card, you're supposed to get an input and a signature. These dummies uh, just went by phone order. Tommy Williams, now just 20 years old, was becoming a regular guest at the Dade County Jail, which was cramping his style. So he developed a new con. The victim, the justice system itself. I was looking for an attorney, and at the time I heard the name Nelson Bailey, and I looked up Palm Beach County, and what do you know? This attorney in West Palm Beach was about to become Tommy's newest identity. Donnie Belbons. One afternoon, Don Sinclair, a Miami bail bondsman, yes. answered his phone. I received a phone call from uh, a Judge Nelson Bailey. Yeah, he elevated me to judge. <laughs> and that I needed him to get my nephew out of jail. And he wanted me to take him out, bond him out. And uh, Judge Bailey said the fee was no problem, nor was the collateral no problem. He came and bonded me out. $35,000? $35,000. And you just talked him into it over the phone? Oh, I'm a judge. He was so convincing, so legitimate, so articulate. I mean, he didn't slip one time, not once. And I walked right out of the Dade County Jail. But at the Dade County Justice Building, the legend of Limo Tommy was secured when he took it all one step further, a scam so outrageous, they still can't believe it. Robert Gluck was the prosecutor assigned to deal with Tommy Williams' long list of cases. One day, he got a phone call from an attorney he'd never heard of before, Mr. Nelson Bailey. And he says, what can I do for you, Nelson? And it's really Tommy Williams sitting in the Dade County Jail right across the street. I says, you have no evidence. You have no signatures. I says, all you've got is a voice over the telephone. How are you going to convict my client? Tommy Williams, who never went to high school, sounded so much like a real lawyer, he was able to negotiate his own plea bargain over the phone. It might have worked, but then the real Nelson Bailey, who had curiously received a court document with Tommy's name on it, put in a call to Prosecutor Gluck. At the very outset of the conversation, he asked me if uh, he hadn't talked to me about 10 minutes ago. I hadn't talked to him ever. I said, you didn't speak with me. I just finished negotiating a plea with you. What do you mean you didn't speak with me? It wasn't me. Tommy talked his way out of jail three more times, and every time he grabbed another limousine and headed for his old neighborhood. Every time, he got arrested again. The last time, by Paul Hernandez. Who was better at the game, you or Paul? In the end, he was. You lost? I lost. Uh, but I made it interesting. In 1991, Limo Tommy was sentenced to 15 years in a maximum security prison as a habitual offender. In 1995, Tommy Williams remained in prison, but said he had a new goal in life, law school, surely a better use of his talents. Most of Tommy's scams were perpetrated by telephone. According to the National Fraud Information Center, telephone scams add up to an annual $40 billion. And a recent survey found that 92% of adult Americans have been victims. Telephone con artists are exploiting the high-speed technology of the banking system. In 1994, a woman telephoned Dorothy Villa and said she had won a diamond watch, a cruise to the Bahamas, and a magazine subscription. All she had to do to collect was give them a special identification number. I said, well, what number? What kind of number? And she said, well, how about your checking account number? Give me the last four digits in your checking account. So I got my checkbook out and I gave it to her. And then she said, well... G give me the whole number of your checking account. So I did. Villa received no prizes, 
But three weeks later, she noticed that $299.50 had been deducted from her checking account. Once they had her checking account number, the con artists had stolen her money by using a bill-paying method called a site draft, often used to make monthly payments like a mortgage. It functions just like a check, but it doesn't need a signature. All that's needed to create a site draft is special printing paper available at most stationery stores and a computer that can reproduce bank processing numbers found on checks. I don't know why I did that. I, I guess I was just so excited because I want to cruise and I mean I believed her. She, I mean they were so good. The best advice we can give is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Coming up, the story of the love bandit, a man who conned women into love and phony investments. One Sometimes personal ads lead to the altar. Sometimes they lead to crime. Our next con man used the personal ads to find his victims. As you'll see in this 1993 report, the ripoff artist who became known as the love bandit left many women with broken hearts and empty bank accounts. Karen Sue France was one of the Love Bandit's first victims. Recently divorced and lonely, she met him at this restaurant in 1986 after he responded to a Lonely Hearts ad she had placed, seeking a financially secure, attractive gentleman to date. What did he say he did? Uh, he was in, in, in investments. Investments? Most, real estate, uh, stocks, bonds. Yeah. Did he look and act the part? Yes, he did. Very, did it very well. He's a great actor. While he was still romancing Karen, the love bandit struck up a relationship with Cheryl McClinco, a single mother with a 12-year-old son. Cheryl was impressed by the man who said he was a Harvard lawyer. I was baking at a Dunkin' Donuts store in the Austin area, and he came in as a customer. How did he go from there? He started bringing me roses. Roses in, at work? Roses in a bakery. <laughs> Later, in 1988, the love bandit started romancing Elizabeth Rodenroth, a 38-year-old mother of two young girls. She, too, was recently divorced and had put an ad in her local paper. This was his reply. Uh, my name is Randy Fox. I am a white, single male, 148 pounds, 5'8", brown eyes, dark hair, 35 years old. Just sounded like a real nice guy. That was the impression he made on most women. At least 12 have come forward from three states so far, and police suspect there are dozens more. He impressed the women's children, too. He was just always so full of life, and he really brought out the best in my mom. He, you know, she was cheerful, and, you know, he, he lifted her spirits, and he lifted all of our spirits. He led them to believe he was a man of means, and wore designer clothes to prove it. And he told them all of his finances were under the control of this woman, his aunt, his only living relative. He told the women he wanted them to sell everything they owned and come overseas to live with him at his home in Europe. And he said, as an investment attorney, he would take their money and invest it wisely. Roughly, what do you think he took uh, total from you? I assume maybe between 20 to 35,000 altogether, probably. If you just get down to the jewelry of my own he took and everything altogether, it would probably roughly fit in that figure. Are you a wealthy?